Hi, this is Jean Badouri. Today I'm going to be talking about tools for creating your presentations and presenting them online. Here's what I'll be covering in this video. Note that creating the presentation, adding the narration, and enabling online access are three separate steps. Why this assignment? Because presentation skills are important to today's information professional. Increasingly, you will be doing these online rather than face-to-face. -face. The classroom is a safe environment to practice skills before you go out into the workplace. If you were in a face-to-face -face class, you would hear everyone else's presentation. So I want students in online classes to have the same experience. This means sharing your presentation, both live and through links. By sharing, we learn a lot from each other, both from the topic that you have chosen and the techniques you use in creating the presentation. Some of you have previous experience, but for those of you who are uncomfortable with the technology, there are alternatives. At the end of this video, you should have a good understanding of the options available to you. Rest assured, all of my students have been successful in creating these narrated PowerPoint presentations. The secret is understanding the different technologies at each step. So let's delve into the details. For grading, I'll be using a rubric which you can find in Canvas. The most important element I'm looking for is whether your presentation conveys the topic effectively both visually and verbally. I also evaluate the overall flow of the presentation and your diction. It's quite distracting to hear dogs barking or traffic in the background. Visual appeal is important in effective communication. Are the colors and visuals you have chosen consistent with the topic? A presentation on children's story times should have a different look and feel than ADA compliance in libraries. And the color shouldn't change drastically from slide to slide. My biggest gripe is readability of the slides. Don't try to cram too much information on each slide, making the fonts too small. Use short phrases, not full sentences. By the way, students aren't the only ones who make this mistake. Often conference co presentations have the same problems. I recommend doing your presentations in PowerPoint for several reasons. It's a standard software in the workplace, so you are building skills that can be demonstrated in your ePortfolios. Yes, the uh, software is available, but you'll minimize glitches by following recommendations. Another reason to use PowerPoint is that the software itself can be used for many different purposes. It's a standard for conferences because you just bring a USB drive and plug it into a conference computer that already has Microsoft software installed. PowerPoint is also frequently used for reports rather than Word documents. It's much easier to add graphics than PowerPoint and create a visual document. I've used PowerPoint to create poster sessions since it isn't limited to the standard papered sizes. Another aspect is simply the amount of support for PowerPoint. There are lots of tutorials on how to use the different features, including my favorite source, YouTube. This is the structure for a presentation, regardless of whether you are presented face-to-face -face or online. You need to create a story that has a nice flow with an introduction, main body, and a conclusion. There should be attractive visuals. There's some examples in Canvas so that you can see how presentations can be put together, though obviously you need to develop your own material. I encourage you to find appropriate images. My style is based on an outline format with a few images, just because I'm used to that format. The current style is to have more pictures than words. 
My final admonition is the same for any presentation, whether classroom or conference. It should be interesting, both from a visual and audio standpoint. A boring face-to-face -face presentation doesn't improve online. There are some basic rules you need to follow in putting together actual slides. The font size has to be readable. If there's too much information on a slide, it needs to be split into multiple slides. Use phrases rather than sentences. Edit out extraneous words, such as the, so the font size is bigger, which is good. Slides should not be a sea of text. Use visuals, including pictures you've taken yourself. PowerPoint has some very powerful features but it's better to stick with the basics to do online presentations. The fundamental problem is that PowerPoint slides are converted to flat images for a live presentation through Collaborate. This means embedded video clips won't be converted. Transitions and animations will also be lost. Though one of the options for pre-recording is narrating directly into PowerPoint, it's questionable whether the bells and whistles will convert to video for sharing. In general, simple works better for this type of presentation. In some ways, short presentations with time limits are more difficult than long presentations which can ramble. I recommend putting your speaker notes, or even the full script of your presentation, in the notes section of your PowerPoint presentations. I use this technique for recording my videos for class. The full script helps organize my presentation and also makes my videos accessible when I create a PDF of a notes view. This is an important step because San Jose State University requires accessibility for multimedia materials created by instructors. If I don't write out the script in advance, the audio has to be transcribed later. Practice really does help. My first run through a presentation is pretty rough. The second and third tries are better. I always end up adding, deleting, and changing slides. It's the same process I use for writing just a different tool. Oftentimes, students don't allow enough time for the practice and revision cycle. These presentations are short, so redoing them is not hard, and the results will be much more professional. Up to this point, this is the same process you would use regardless of whether you're presenting live or pre-recording. The next step is to add audio to your slides. Frankly, this step takes the most experimentation to determine what works best for you as the presenter. The first option is a live presentation using Blackboard Collaborate, our online conference platform. This should be familiar to you from your 203 class. The second option is to use software that is on your computer. With recent changes to PowerPoint, I can now recommend it for actually recording your presentations. For students who are more technical or have previous experience with video editing, the free Windows Movie Maker or iMovie for the Mac are options. Camtasia is a commercial software with extensive editing capabilities. The third option is to pre-record your presentation using one of the free online services I'll be discussing later. So let's take a look at the pros and cons of each of these approaches to narrating the presentation. The first alternative is a live presentation using our web conferencing software. The problem with live presentations, whether face-to-face -face or virtual, is that everyone has to be available at the same time. That's not easy in our environment. Let's talk about some of the idiosyncrasies. First of all, PowerPoint software does not run on a web conferencing platform. This means your presentations must be saved as images, with each slide as an image in a folder. These images are then uploaded. This means that any bells and whistles, such as transitions, just disappear. 
For some of you, a live presentation is simpler than trying to use the other recording techniques. You just have to put together the PowerPoint slides, then make the presentation. Obviously, since these presentations are live, you can't redo it if there are technical problems. The second option is to pre-record your presentation by either recording your PC or using an online narration service. Once recorded, you will submit the URL so that I can view it along with the rest of the class. The overall process is pretty much the same regardless of recording technique. The first step is to finalize your PowerPoint presentation from the visual appearance to the script that will be recorded. The next step is to decide how you're going to record the audio. Features are different, so it can take some experimentation to figure out which one is the most workable. If you have a trouble doing it one way, try a different way. There may be subtle incompatibilities in the layers of software. And try the FAQs if you encounter glitches. The next step is to actually record the presentation. A separate headset with a mic provides a much better voice quality than the microphone and speakers built into your computer since the mic itself has to be close to your mouth. The recording should also be done in a quiet room with as little background noise as possible. The objective is to have clearly understandable voice narration. Chances are you won't be satisfied with your first attempt to record your presentation. Simply redo the recording rather than trying to edit it, which is harder to do. Be sure to save the recording. If you rec record on your PC, then you'll need to upload it to a video sharing service, such as YouTube or, Vid or Vimeo. The service will provide a URL to your stored video, and this is what you will submit to me to view and grade. Now let's take a look at the different approaches. You can use your PC to record the audio for your presentation using your current software. You're already using PowerPoint, so narration can be added directly to your presentation. You can also use software included with your operating system, so you don't have to purchase additional software. The Mac has iMovie and Windows includes Windows Movie Maker, which some of you may already be using. You can purchase additional programs for editing, Camtasia is the high-end software widely used by video professionals. There's also open source software, but support is always an issue there. Audacity is one open source program that is widely used to record audio, which can then be added to the visuals for the final presentation. Once you've completed the final version and it's working locally, then you can upload the final version to a video sharing service to share with the class. You may be surprised to see that this is my current top recommendation. For a long time, I did not recommend using PowerPoint for recording narration. But software changes. The 2010 version of PowerPoint now creates video output which can then be uploaded to any of the video sharing services. It actually works pretty smoothly, though you have to allow ample time to produce the final file. The process is pretty simple. For a live presentation, you would use the presentation 4x3 default. However, if you are going to upload to YouTube, you need to set the size ratio to 16x9 using the on-screen ratio dropdown. This step eliminates the black bars that you see on both sides of the screen if you don't change the ratios. Then you can record in PowerPoint using the speaker notes you created previously. Recording is done slide by slide, and you can use the pause button liberally. It'll take some practice to make the process go smoothly, so remember you can re-record individual slides. Sometimes it takes two or three tries, but by the time I review the entire presentation, I'm happy with the results. The last step is to create the actual WMV file. 
This step takes a while, so be patient. Go get a leisurely cup of coffee or even two cups. Once this file is created, you can upload it to YouTube or another video sharing service. Be sure to enable sharing. A common glitch is forgetting to allow sharing so I can give you a grade. The last alternative is to use a free online narration service. Some of you may have access to other services, but I want you to be able to demonstrate the value of these capabilities in your organization without having to justify a budget expenditure. In addition, job seekers can use these tools to build a portfolio for potential employers. My favorite service was MyBrainChart.com, but it is being discontinued. Darn. SlideShare videos is also gone. That leaves Screencast-O-Matic and Jing. Both of these services work, but they require continuous recording rather than the slide-by-slide -slide narration, which I prefer. Your workplace may provide other services. At San Jose State University, we have Panopto for instructors, but not for students. Many organizations have Adobe products, but these don't have free versions for students. Screencast-O-Matic allows you to record audio while viewing part of your screen. This means any program can be running on your desktop. A PowerPoint document or a web browser such as Chrome or IE or Firefox. For PowerPoint, this means putting the presentation into slideshow mode then adding narration while going through the slides. There's a pause button to stop and start narration. This approach, however, means that you need to re-record the entire presentation if there's a glitch in the middle. For short presentations, this is not a big deal, but might be an issue for longer presentations. There are additional capabilities, particularly some editing tools, that are available in the Pro version. However, I try to avoid editing when possible by simply redoing the narration. Pro also includes unlimited recording rather than the 15-minute limit. One caveat. Evidently, this service works better with a Windows PC than a Mac. Jing is a favorite for students because it's easy to use. It is similar to Screencast-O-Matic since it does screen capture. The narration is somewhat secondary. It's another platform that records from start to finish. Jing is particularly good to demonstrate technical features, but it's not as good for PowerPoint presentations. The primary limitation is the five minute limit, and there isn't an option to go over that time. Most students don't use Jing because it's hard to time a presentation precisely. Unfortunately, the upgrade is to buy a TechSmith software package. I bought Snagit and really like the product. It's great for annotating screenshots for Word documents. Camtasia is a professional level video editing tool, but it's probably too expensive for most of you to consider. Snagit is more reasonable. Earlier versions of PowerPoint required a third-party conversion before a narrated PowerPoint could be uploaded to a video sharing service. OfferStream is an option for this conversion that my students have used in the past. It supposedly preserves all the bells and whistles when that PowerPoint is uploaded to their service. In practice, it hasn't worked particularly well for my students. It also seems to be sensitive to sensitive to the version level of PowerPoint. You're welcome to try other options, as long as I can see your presentation and hear your voice. Students find that adding audio to a PowerPoint presentation is the most challenging step. It's easy to underestimate the learning curve required to make the technology work for your particular software configuration. Each of the options I've talked about is different and takes some time to figure out the ins and outs. If the first one doesn't work, just try a different approach. 
The final step is providing access so that I can grade your presentation. This means submitting your URL as part of the assignment and sharing that URL with your classmates. If you pre-record on your PC using PowerPoint, iMovie, Windows Movie Maker, Snagit, or Camtasia, then you have to upload your presentation to one of these services. The most obvious one is YouTube, and I do recommend you learn how to get your presentation loaded there. But there are other options. SchoolTube may work better for an educational environment where access to YouTube may be blocked. If you used an online narration service, you can just submit the URL created when you record your presentation. The service actually provides the online storage and access. You can take the extra step and upload your presentation to another service, such as YouTube, but you're not required to do so. Remember, you can use these presentations for your ePortfolios, so decide where you want to keep them. I recommend you store a copy on your hard drive. And don't forget to keep a backup of the PowerPoint itself so that you could modify and cre recreate your presentation. Here are some tips to minimize glitches as you access these layers of software. The first is to use the same version of PowerPoint for the entire process. I've had students use one version on a Mac at home and then make changes at work on a PC using the more current version and then wonder why they had trouble. Creating visually attractive presentations is a useful skill in today's workplace, so I encourage you to explore the powerful tools that you will find in PowerPoint. One of the problems with the services I've discussed today is that they can have software incompatibilities, so check the FAQs to make sure your format is compatible with the service that you have selected. The last tip, allowing enough time, is always hard. Just assume that there will be glitches and allow some extra time. In summary, it's relatively straightforward to do an effective presentation in the online environment. It's just a different set of technology than face-to-face. -face. You may need to get assistance from family and friends and teenagers can be a great source of help. Certainly my 20-something son has bailed me out of a few technical problems. All of my students have been able to make online presentations with a few bumps along the way. The key is having technology choices so that you can decide the level that works for you. At the end of the semester, students from my previous classes admit they learned a lot from this assignment. These are skills that you can use throughout the school program and even more importantly in your professional life. Yes, you can do these online presentations.